I, I don't know about you, um, but I just have days where I'm tired on the inside. i tired that sleep doesn't fit, fix. Uh, i tired that doesn't seem to go away because you just look around and you're like, is this ever going to end? You know, what started out as like a couple weeks has now become a few months and the more you watch the news, the more you read about it, you're more like, man, this thing is not a couple months. This is like potentially a year or two that we're going to be in this thing called COVID-19. And that we're going into summer, which officially kicked off yesterday, but it doesn't really feel like summer. It kind of it felt like what spring felt like. Uh, a lot still in your house, just hotter outside. And uh, one of the stories in the Old Testament, in Jewish scriptures, is um, focused on... Israel during this period of their history when they wandered around in the desert. And over the next two um, weeks, I want to kind of unpack a series called The Wander Years, Um, because I think there's some lessons that they they played out, that they experienced, that can actually be helpful for you and I. If you feel stuck, if you feel trapped, if you feel um, like you're living with a tired that sleep doesn't fix. And you're just ready to like, man, get this thing over with and get out. And that a group of people walking through the desert almost 3,000 years ago can actually help us as we walk through this summer, potentially this fall, of what we're experiencing as new fall guidelines get rolled out over the next few weeks with school systems and as new work guidelines get rolled out over the next couple of months for what life will look like for us in the fall and in the winter. And they... I think, have a profound amount of of wisdom to give us. Sometimes the wisdom comes in what to do, and sometimes the wisdom can be gleaned from watching a group of people and what not to do. And so we kick off in a book of, um, it's called the book of Numbers, and Numbers is primarily focused on the period of time where Israel was wandering in the desert and all the occasions around that. There's three different books in the first five books of Jewish scriptures, a Pentateuch or, or Old Testament that focus on this, you've got it in Exodus, you have it in Deuteronomy, and you have it in the book of Numbers. And Numbers is where I want to go to today because Numbers in chapter 11, which is already loaded in the app, um, actually gives us the moment I want to look at to help us have wisdom in this kind of, as we move through our own personal desert years. Um, and it says the rabble with them began to crave other food, and them being the this million plus people that came out of Egypt. So the backstory of the the Israeli people is that uh, for hundreds of years they were um, kind of oppressed, conquered, enslaved by the Egyptians. And the Egyptian um, empire was built on the backs of the slaves of from Israel, these Jewish slaves. And God had given them a promise that He was going to deliver them. And so He steps into Egypt, and through a series of miraculous moments, breaks them free. And they leave Egypt, and some scholars believe there were almost a million Jewish people who departed from Israel. I mean, departed from Egypt as as Israel the people. And as they begin to travel, this passage here is about two years and two months into the journey. And it says that the rabble with them, the small group of people, begin to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if we only had meat to eat, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onion, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. So in this moment, we see uh, a little bit of kind of frustration starting to come up to the surface. We see a group of people who are irritated, who are bored, who are done, who are tired on the inside and on the outside. They're living in a desert, which is pretty harsh. Uh, The temperatures, even today, can get up to 130 on those those extremely hot days. Uh, There's hardly any rainfall. I think it's like three millimeters a year. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a really dry, parched area. And they're so hungry. They're so frustrated. They're so tired. And they begin to kind of play out something that they play out multiple times. They start to grumble and complain. 
There are a couple of things I want to kind of highlight in this brief passage. There are a few things I want us to take away this morning that I think could be really helpful. The first is you notice it says the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing. Now, the way this frustration started was through a small group of people who began to complain. Through a small group of people who were frustrated, who were disappointed, who were angry. And that small group took their emotions and it went viral. Their complaints, their attitudes went viral. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the negative attitudes are kind of contagious. You can catch it. And when you spend time with people whose worlds are marked by negativity, when you spend time with people whose worlds are marked by all they don't have, when they, people who are focused and fixated, they're kind of the Debbie Downer. They're kind of just the, the negative Nelly. They're always like, man, this is, life just stinks. And this is who this rabble is. They're a group of people who are just frustrated at what they see everywhere. And their frustration becomes contagious and it spreads through the community. And I think this is one of those helpful pointers for you and I as we find ourselves in the desert. That in the desert, the people we're listening to become even more important than they've ever been. You see, it's in our hard places that we need to be more conscious of what we're hearing coming in. Because in the desert world, in the desert seasons of life, negative voices are amplified in us. I think this is one of those practical pieces for us as we spend time on social media. We hear other people's complaints. We hear other people's frustrations. When we sit around and have gripe fests and we call our friends and all we do is complain about our husband or our wives or our kids or how we're so tired of this season. And, and those things are legitimate sometimes. But when all that marks us is our, our kind of fixation of the negative voices, then what starts to happen is it starts to distort how we see our reality. I, I see this play out with couples who are going through marital strife. I see this play out with employers. I see this play out with people who used to be friends. It's what was one negative moment starts to become kind of this far kind of sweeping indictment. It was just an incident, but now it's an indictment. You know, you're never kind. You're always this way. You're always like that. And we go from incidences, like just moments, to indictments over the entire kind of sweeping life. And we want to be careful to those always, those evers, those nevers that start to leak out of our mouth, those complaints. And that oftentimes those things come in because of other people that we are seeing and that we're listening to, that we're looking to. It isn't just through complaint. Another insidious way it creeps in is through comparison. When you scroll through social media and you're like, well, how is that person on an island somewhere? I thought nobody was traveling anywhere. And like, they're on an island or they're, they're having, you know, this, they've got this little kind of Coco Cabana set up on the beach and, you know, they're sipping on their drinks and life is easy. Or look at their pool or look at what their backyard looks like. I mean, we just start to find all these little tiny things. Oh, look at that relationship they're in. I wish my husband or I wish I had my wife was like that. That it's not just through the complaints that we listen to. It's also through the inner voice of comparison that creeps in too. And that when we're in the desert, we want to be conscious of the people we're looking to and the people we're listening to because they will shape what you see. And when we're in hard seasons, that's even more important. It isn't just the people creeping in though. Notice how the people and their voice starts to influence the choice of words. It says that Israel starts to say, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. I mean, they shift from like, oh man, I wish we... To like, now they're reading out the menu that they used to have at their buffet every single day. Listen to how they'd explain. It's like, if only we had meat, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. 
Well, yes, it was at no cost because you were enslaved. But if you just read that on the surface, it sounds like this, these people are in a Mediterranean all-inclusive resort. Man, remember the buffet? You remember the cucumbers and the melons? They were so fresh. And man, those leeks that just sprouted up and the onions, all oh, the onions. And remember the garlic, the spices, the way they just brought out the flavor and the food. Oh, remember all that? And we didn't pay a dime for it. It was amazing. It's like, well, no, you didn't pay a dime for it because you were enslaved. That was your prison food. But they don't see that. All they see, all they remember, all they romanticize is distortions. And I think the challenge for us when we get into seasons like this is that not only are we listening and looking to others and, and they're having an impact on us, which is why groups matter. So if you haven't signed up for groups, sign up. Make sure you have those positive voices in your life. But if you're not careful, then those voices are going to start to influence how you choose to see the world around you. And what comes with that is distortion. All you see is your pain in the present. All you see is current reality. You don't see actuality of where you came from. And what started off as something small, right, it, that they don't have a certain menu, they don't have this picture, what started out as not having meat on the menu has now turned into wailing, lamenting, an, uh, an over-exaggeration. Let me illustrate it, I think, in a way. See, what happens is, you see, they ended up having this reality where what was small has now completely covered their purview. What used to be something that could be held in their hand has now completely taken over their entire perspective. See, on the stage, when I'm up there on the stage, it's huge, it's massive, you, you see me. You see a television. But all it takes is a tiny phone to cover up everything that you've seen. And this is one of the dangers. This is one of the realities. This is one of the struggles we can have when we find ourselves in desert places. We get so fixated on what's in front of us that it covers up all the good things around us. That we become like children. Like my own personal children, right? Who, if you were to sit down with my daughter at Mills, and you were to ask her to describe some of the mills that we have, and all you heard was her explanation, you may think, man, the way they eat is horrible. It's nasty. But in reality, she may be describing a steak dinner. But because she's so focused and fixated on the mac and cheese she didn't get, that she just will miss out on the good that's in front of her. And we sometimes we laugh. We're eating and um, we're like eating really good food. My wife's a really good cook. And, and she's lamenting. It's like it becomes World War III. I mean, you're like, okay, this is the, if, if you don't eat this, you are never getting up from this table. Do you understand? We will set up a sleeping bag and a cot. And if, not really. But I mean, it just, it, it goes from a meal to this nuclear missile level response because she's gotten caught up in what's in front of her and she's lost sight of all the good things around her. You see, it says that they remember the fish. They've distorted the fact that it was through enslavement. They remember the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But listen how, but we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. And it's one of those moments when I remember when I was reading this passage, like I literally like LOL'd. I laughed out loud because I was like, these people are ridiculous. I am ridiculous because what they didn't, what they'd failed to, to remember, what they'd forgotten was that there should have been no food in the desert in the first place. There shouldn't have been manna Period. A million people don't walk through the desert and have daily meals. Like, that's not logistically possible. 
They had lost sight of the miraculous manna that came up every single day for them. They were fixated on the meat they did not have, and they were ignoring the miraculous that they held all around them. They'd fallen into the trap of comparison and complaining. Oh, remember that meat. All we got is this manna. All we have is manna. And they had forgotten that God was providing for them every single day. Because when God had delivered them from Egypt, He was also delivering them to a promised land. And sometimes in the midst of desert seasons, not only do we distort where we've come from, not only do we remember relationships that were destructive and, and damaging, not only do we remember the habits, whether it's alcohol or Maybe it's some pills, or maybe it's pornography, or maybe it's that escape route that we take, that we find escape. We, we remember all of that with like, oh, remember how it made me relax. Oh, remember how it helped me feel better. And we forget the bondage. We forget the enslavement. We forget the, the trap. We forget the money we wasted. We forget the time we wasted. And not only that, we lose sight of what could be. The potential future gets lost too. And that, that's the danger of walking through a desert is that the miraculous becomes manna. Like, man, I'm so done with manna. And that if we're going to be people who walk through these wander years, then I think it's helpful to remember that God doesn't just deliver us from something, but that like the Israelis walking through the desert, they were also been, being delivered to something too. And this is why this is so helpful. So Moses, who's the writer of Numbers, doesn't just stop in that story. He actually does something interesting. He breaks that story. He separates it. And he goes on. Before he continues, he um, puts this little parenthetical thought. He says this. He goes, um, I want to make sure that you know, the manna was like coriander seed. So he's adding on to this. He's like, no, no, no. Before we continue this story, I want you to know what manna is. Because one day, future generations won't know what manna is. And if all they have is your description, it's going to be like listening to my daughter describe a steak dinner. It was nasty. It was chewy. It was fill in the blank. And Moses doesn't want the future generations. This is written for you and me who will grow up in a season in a life when we don't know what manna is. So he describes it. He says, manna was like coriander seed and it looked like resin. He was like, it had texture. It was interesting. This is an Instagram worthy kind of thing. It's like, here, me and my manna biscuit, right? I mean, like this was something interesting. This was something that looked enticing. He said, the people went around gathering it. He was like, oh, by the way, this, this just showed up. This, this was like Instacart. This was DoorDash before those things existed. God dropped food down on them. It's kind of like growing up when you were little and it was just like, it just appeared on the kitchen table. You're like, where did this come from? It's because your parents worked really hard and they did all that stuff while you were playing outside, right? It's just, it's just showing up and they just go to pick it up from the buffet. And then it says they ground it into a hand mill. Or they crushed it into a mortar. He's like, so not only is it interesting, is it Instagram worthy? Is it tasty? He's like, it had a lot of flexibility with what you could do with it. You could, you could hand mill it. You could crush it. He was like, you could cook it in a pot or you could make it in the loaves. He was like, it was a stew. It was a sandwich. Like there was so much potential in manna. And it tasted something like made with olive oil. He was like, this thing had explosions of flavor. Another one of the accounts would talk about the sweetness of honey. I mean, this was a yummy treat. And Moses doesn't want to leave them. Doesn't want to leave us in this generation reading this story disconnected from the reality of what it was like. And that he wanted us to remember that when the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down, that it was a miracle of God. Because the God who had delivered them from their enslavement was the same faithful God who was going to deliver them to the promised land. And the God who can deliver from and the God who can deliver to is also the God who is faithful in the in-between too. And that sometimes we lose sight of that. We fixate on what we don't have in our life. We've, we so focus on what we don't have present or how we're stuck in this pandemic. 
And we can miss out on what we were supposed to get out of this moment. I think that's why Moses wants to make sure that future generations reading this story don't miss it. Because Israel was in danger of missing out. Because all they wanted to do was get out. They wanted to escape. And I believe, quite honestly, that the things that oftentimes we just want to get out of, God wants to get out of something in us through it. That what we want to get out of, that what we just want to get away from, God wants to make a way through because there was something he wants to get out of you and me. And that what the desert season does for us is a lot like walking through downtown Boston at night. So when you walk through the city, um, it's one of the iconic buildings in my mind when I think about the city is the Hancock Building. And how the, the blue glass just kind of reflects what's happening all around it. The sunset, it's beautiful. Uh, but whenever you walk by the Hancock Building at day, it's a vastly different experience than when you walk by it at night. Because at night, all of a sudden, what looked like one clear sheet of blue glass is now hundreds of little boxes with computer screens and conference rooms and people walking back and forth. That I love seeing buildings at night because during the day when you can't see in, it's like when the light goes away, the light inside the building illuminates and all of a sudden this like impenetrable fortress becomes a see-through. You can see everything happening inside of it. And I think desert seasons, the benefit of desert seasons is that they do a lot like that for us. We find ourselves in these kind of seasons and we, we don't have, we're not as patient as we used to be or we find ourselves getting frustrated or we find ourselves turning back to things that we thought we'd gotten free of. And we can fall into the trap of believing that those things weren't there, they were in the desert and that we stumbled across them. But oftentimes, it's only in the desert that we can actually see through what's on the inside of us. It's easy to be patient when everything is going your way. It's not that you're not patient. It's just that you don't have anything to practice your patience on. So now you have all these opportunities and you realize you're not as patient as you thought you were. And that desert scenes reveal what's hidden underneath. They reveal what the good times conceal. And that when we find ourselves in the desert and we just want to get out, I think that's God's gracious gift to sometimes for us for him to help us get some things out of us that's been there all along. Israel had not known dependence on God. They had not learned how to be grateful. That was a problem in Egypt, just as it was in the desert. But now they were having to learn how to do it because it was being revealed. All of that junk on the inside. The night had come, and the light from within was illuminating all of that junk lurking underneath the surface. It's why um, when I'm counseling couples about to get married, I'm going to say, hey, um, one of the things that you realize after you, have, after you get married or after you have kids is you realize how selfish you are. They don't make you selfish. They reveal how selfish you already are. And because before, no one was there telling you what to do. No one was bumping up against your schedule. No one was squeezing the toothpaste in the middle because only maniacs do that. Right. And like now you're in this season where stuff's being revealed that previous seasons had concealed. And that one of the I think things that reading the account in numbers calls us to is to remind us of the fact that maybe there's something in the desert that you and I are walking in that God wants to graciously graciously help us get out and get away from. Maybe there's some things in our lives that he's wanting to help remove and that the way he can remove it is he first has to reveal it. And that sometimes it's easy for me to pray bold prayers in good times where I'm like, God, I want to be a man of faith or God, I want to be patient or God, I want to be generous or God, I want to be kind. And then I hit a hard season and all of a sudden my faith feels like it's falling apart and my kindness is very low and I'm not very gracious or generous and I can look at that season and say, God, where are you at? I, that's what I wanted. And now I don't even have it anymore. And I think sometimes in his mercy, he was like, no, you didn't have it before. But you thought you did. You thought you were patient. 
but there was nothing to reveal that you weren't. You thought you were generous because you had excess and there was nothing to sacrifice for. You thought you were kind when that was because you were the boss and everybody did what you said. And that these seasons we walk through can help reveal what's been concealed all along. And there's a picture that I think is a really helpful reminder. In fact, the New Testament writer Paul, when he's trying to summarize what the transformation of the Christian life looks like, he actually uses um, a, a word in the Greek that eventually becomes the word called metamorphosis. When etymologists, when, uh, or not etymologists, when uh, insect uh, researchers were trying to kind of grab a word out of kind of the ancient vocabulary to capture what happens to a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, they use this word that Paul writes to summarize and visualize the transformation of a Christian and that process of God constantly refining and transforming us. And so metamorphosis, the caterpillar to butterfly, like that's a really popular uh, kind of idea in our culture. No doubt you have been exposed to it many times. But have you ever spent time actually studying the process a caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly? So what happens is, you know, the chubby little caterpillar goes up and starts to kind of form this external chrysalis. And you and I on the outside just marvel because it's like magic, right? It goes in a chubby little caterpillar and it comes out this beautiful, colorful butterfly or moth. And But actually what's happening on the inside is once the chrysalis is completely locked in and it's watertight, then the caterpillar's body begins to release a series of enzymes that begins to break the caterpillar's body down. In fact, if you were to kind of cut open a chrysalis at that critical point in the process, what would ooze out of the chrysalis is, is just a soupy goo. That the caterpillar's body literally liquefies inside of the cocoon and chrysalis. The only thing that doesn't is a series of a group of cells that scientists call the imaginal disc. Now, that sounds like something Walt Disney would have on some ride or, or uh, would have been a toy in some Disney movie, right? And search your imaginal disc into your imaginal disc player and watch the magic happen, right? Like, imaginal disc sounds fantasy. But these imaginal disc, these imaginal disc, as the soup and caterpillars liquefied around it, begins to grab hold of the protein, and it supercharges the growth. And what grows out of these imaginal discs are all the new body parts. So the, this imaginal disc turns into a wing, and this imaginal disc turns into a wing, and these little imaginal discs turn into the antenna and the legs. And, and, and so the caterpillar literally liquefies, and then it starts to, to regrow and transform. And at no point in that process is it pretty. At no, like, like, none of us walking, people will pay money to walk into a butterfly garden, right? And they'll be like, oh, look, five butterflies on me. This is amazing. But nobody would pay $5 or $10 to walk into a, a caterpillar garden. Oh, look at the five worms on my hand. This is so magical. And nobody would walk into a, a garden where chrysalises were oozing slimy caterpillar like liquid goo on their bodies either like everything about that is gross and yet we will pay money to see the final product but we are repulsed by the process and what i'm saying to you is that sometimes the desert is the process and in the process of going through the desert you have to remember that there is a final product on the other side For Israel, it was the promised land. For Christians, it's the promises that God will take all things, regardless how devastating they are, and he can use them for our good. He can take any tragedy, loss, and grief, and in the midst of it, do something that transforms us and leaves us better, not bitter. Because there's something imaginal inside of us that God's using to transform us. And that just like a caterpillar, you can't shortcut the process. And if you try to get out of the process, you end up looking worse than how you went in before. 
I'm not trying to downplay the pain. But I'm just saying, I've lived long enough, I've lived enough decades to have seen God do this in my life, and I know it works. I know that there's a pain. I know there's a grief when you're walking through a season of not yet, or a season that feels like forever. But I can tell you that there's always, always in life, a season of life will eventually be reduced down to a sentence. And what will you say about this season? Five years from now, when people talk about COVID-19, when they talk about this season, was this a season that you embraced the financial challenges and for the first time did the uncomfortable shift of working off a budget for your family? Or maybe for the first time that you made some shifts and began to have difficult conversations or maybe that you begin to rework and re rehabitualize some new habits in your life to move away from the addictions and from the escapism that was present in your life. Because what I am confident and sure of, just like the butterfly, just like the desert passages, and just like my life shows over and over, and just like your life shows too, that all significant change and growth oftentimes happens in the middle of uncomfortable and unpleasant. Everything that you and I desire to be is on the other side of uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to start to rebuild a relationship by having uncomfortable conversations. It's, it's really uncomfortable to go to a gym and start to get physically healthy. It's really uncomfortable to start living by a budget and stop swiping a credit card because of the instant gratification you feel. All the profound transformation that you and I desire is on the other side of uncomfortable. And there is a God who invites us into the desert not to destroy us, but to transform us. And that if you're willing to submit this season to Him, what I can tell you is if you walk through the process, you'll be amazed at the product. That Father's Day used to be a day I erased from my memory. And as God has transformed me, as God has done something extraordinary in my life and rescued me, they brought me out of the, the destructive choices and habits and sins. Because sometimes people are like, oh, God rescued me from mistakes. No, no, no. Mistakes are things I didn't mean to do. There are things in my life I meant to do. And those pursuit of those things, what I was really looking for was I kept looking for it in the wrong place. What Israel desired was sustenance, but they were remembering the sustenance, and they were looking back to the wrong place they kept finding it. And, and God knows what you and I were made for. And we were intended to experience those things, but to experience it in the right way at the right time because it brings life. And that God rescued me from those dark, destructive things, and it brought life to me. And so Father's Day is an amazing day for me. Not just because of my kids, but because one of my kids is named after a man who stepped into my life and adopted me as a son when I didn't have to be. He changed the way I saw fathers. Because he said, hey, I want you to know, you've never asked for this, but I really consider you to be my third son. And when people ask me, how many kids do I have? I tell them I have three, because you're one of them. He didn't have to say that. He didn't have to do that. But the way he loved and the way he led and the way he invited me into his life began to change the way I saw Father's Day. And that there are so many things in my life, and I imagine so many things in your life that maybe you wouldn't pay to go through it again. But if the only way you could get what you got out of it was to go through it again, you'd go through it again. Because there are gifts in the desert. There are things in the desert. There are things that only grow in the desert. And so let's make sure that as we walk through, we're careful about the people we listen to, that we are conscious about the perspective that we have, and that we submit to the process knowing it can be painful, but the final product can be beautiful. Let's not waste these wonder years.